Hello, everyone, and welcome to Conversations on Sex, Addiction, and Relationships. So glad that you're here. I'm joined uh, today, as always, with my good friends, Wendy Conquest, Jeannie Vitoni, and Dan Drake, who today gets to be both a member of the Conversations crew, but also uh, part of the team that we are actually having a conversation with, which is Dan Drake and Janice Cottle, who have written a couple books on... Uh, therapeutic disclosure, one for the addict prep and one for the partner prep to help therapists and couples walk through this process. So excited to have this conversation. And Dan, I'm thrilled that we get to put you in this dual role today. Yeah, it's a little weird. I'm excited. I'm excited to have Janice on too and talk about this. Yeah. So disclosure, um, first of all, I think we might want to define for our community what that is because some folks who listen to us are familiar in the sex addiction world, betrayal trauma world, but other folks have no idea what we're talking about. So which one of us wants to do a simple definition and we'll start there. I love it. You all want to <laughs> Wendy do Wendy wants to? <laughs> so I'll, so I think Dan's the ex expert in this, but I'll, I'll take a stab at it. How about it? Let's do it. All right, so um, when, uh, when there's been a secret sexual behavior and um, the partner finds out, this is called discovery in, in our field. We, we say that this is discovery. Um, and a lot of times at discovery, um, the addict will start uh, talking about and all the things that they have done. Um, and we call, uh, we, this is not a therapeutic disclosure. This is simply a disclosure. It's usually uh, not beneficial. It can be very harmful and hurtful to the partner. Um, it is usually um, done in a sort of uh, a, a passionate, uh, uncontained, um, not thought out way. And so uh, we found that this is uh, um, this is not this not helpful or uh, and it can uh, really harm the the partner. So what we want is what's called a therapeutic disclosure, and um, this is where the addict takes uh, time and energy and um, a lot of preparation. Um, and I want to talk to the whole team uh, and Janice as well about, well, how long should a disclosure take to, to prepare? Because in our field, there's a lot of controversy around this. But it is a, a, a very, it's a more thoughtful, uh, intentional, um, uh, detailed, but not too detailed um, document that's created and then uh, intentionally shared with the partner with therapeutic support so in a perfect world it would be her therapist and uh, sorry don't want to use gender so the addicts therapist the partner's therapist um, and done in a very mindful thoughtful thorough way how's that Whew. Well wow nice. <laughs> nice all right night. good night <laughs> well, well let's get, i say let's, let's get janice doctor. on here Let's bring the let's bring the ex, ex the other expert in. Janice, you wanna you wanna join us? Hey, there you hey are. Guys. Hey guys. Hi. Hey Janice. Hey. Um, I would like to start just by throwing the book up there. So if people want to get into that or find this. And and guys, uh, Janice and Dan, where where can they find these books? Um, Amazon. Amazon. And what are, what are right. the names of so, the books for the people who can't see them? Right. So I'm going to start. Yeah. So I'm going to start. So um, I am holding up full disclosure, how to share the truth after sexual betrayal. And this is for the addict. And that's um, the blue one. It has blue. Yeah. It has a blue cover. And then I've got the partner one, which is a green cover, broken glass, green cover. Full disclosure, seeking truth after sexual behavior. So about that thick. And those are by Dan Drake and Janice Cottle and can be found on Amazon. There we go. How did you guys come to be that you wrote this book? <laughs> Janice, you want to do that or do you want me to start it? Um, I think you should. Both of you guys. 
Well, it just took a long time for these books to come up, come to pass. So there are a lot of stories. That's why Dan and I are kind of sharing some um, memories. Um, it really started like uh, with the two of us working on a different project where the, uh, the subject of disclosure came into being and a really lively, juicy conversation and um, me discovering that for his clients, Dan had begin, begun writing sort of materials and that um, I'd been like doing the same for my clients and we just, we printed them out. We kind of laid out what we had and we realized we've got like a really good start on a workbook um, and made the decision to start from there, uh, thinking it would be really quick and easy because we do this all really, really fast. And then what we kept discovering is when we actually wrote out all the, the, the things that those of us who guide disclosures do, it's a lot. Um, yeah. 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 I'll, I'll just say we, I, at least me, I never set out to write a giant book on disclosure. That wasn't the initial, like we, we were working on something else and then putting it together. And we thought this would be quick, like Jenna said. And I think as you can see, the we, we there's so many pieces to it that um, we tried. What we try to do is is break down the process. There's a lot of resources out there already on disclosure, but we try to break it down into the dis different decision points. So the reason, you know, there's there's a exercise in in the addicts book that corresponds to one in the partners book. So we really try to to have them go together to be used in conjunction with each other. And unfortunately. Um, the, the synergistic process. So Janice would come up with this amazing exercise and I'm like, oh shoot, I don't have anything on the, the addict side that corresponds to that. So I would have to write something and then, you know, I would have something. And so these kind of, you'll see they're, they're a little bit big, but uh, yeah. incomprehensive. Well, well, yeah, you would, you would come up with something and then it's, oh, wait a second. I've got to prepare the partners for that because they're not going to get that. They're not going to understand that. And so um, the, the, you know, the process is really designed for those who are actually going through it so that couples can do it in sync with a, a common language and a common understanding around, around boundaries and, and hopefully uh, a common purpose of restoring truth um, in the process of rebuilding intimacy. Would you just build on that? Because I'm kind of thinking that there are probably people out there listening to this, and I know that there are addicts that come into my office, and they kind of have the reaction of, you want me to do what? There is no way on God's green earth I'm going to do that. That's just going to be devastating and end my relationship. So why on earth are we recommending that couples do a full therapeutic disclosure? And can both of you refer to some of the statistics that you have in the book? Because there are there is some data behind why this is beneficial. Yeah. Dan, you want to take that one from me? Yeah. Too? Well, let me just let me just I thank you, Tim, because especially, and this is where where the the one of the first points of trying to understand betrayal trauma and how we heal from it. So if you're on the the addict side, if 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 you're the one that has engaged in these behaviors. Generally, an, an addict has learned over time, um, I have to hide these behaviors from other people because I, at my core, I feel unlovable, defective, unworthy. I feel a lot of shame. I feel bad about myself. I don't want people to find out about these behaviors I've been engaged in because if they knew what I've been doing, they would reject me, abandon me. And so a lot of times the addiction is met with so much you know, secrecy and hiding and gaslighting and deception. Um, and post discovery, after the partner discovers something, uh, we found that to heal, like if, if I heal, you know, I've got cancer, for example. So I've got, I've got a tumor in my body. We want to make sure we got all the, all that tumor out before, before we're closing things up and, and trying to heal. So same thing here. If we've got a cancerous problematic behavior that's that's kind of infected our relationship we need to know that we've got it all before we, we, we can start getting a new foundation to heal from so i guess i can empathize with the addict side how hard this is for them to say no actually it's the healing journey is the exact opposite of what you've practiced your whole life of hiding in secrecy it's actually sharing the truth that's going to uh, actually heal and restore your relationship so it goes against everything that addicts uh, uh, believe and yet 
that's what we found. Uh, this is probably this is more Schneider and Gorley's research. Uh, do you have the stats for that, Janice? Around. I could make them up and, and be a, a good approximation. Um, not necessarily theirs per se, but um, in, in the, the the studies that are out there, and Dan and I did some sort of informal survey data that was really very consistent with what's out there. And so of that, of the studies there that I'm familiar with, over 93% of both the, the, the partners and the addicts reported that the process was beneficial. And my um, recollection is that that is true regardless of whether the relationship continued or not. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I think that's Schneider and Corley's work. Yeah, I was going to say we want to put that out to folks because some people will say, "Well, where where was that study?" And it's yeah, it, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, well just to follow up on that though, um, Dan, you did a really good job of talking about like the, the benefits, the personal recovery for the addict. And Tim, you ask about like relational stuff. And I sort of want to point out that there's like two pieces yeah. that we're really looking for progress and healing. And while the relational stuff might be iffy for a while, um, because if your partner's going to be in, in um, a great deal of pain and grieving, and depending on the degree of discrepancy between how much was known and how much was shared it could be a lot of shock. So the relationship is sort of, it's a little more iffy for a while. It's uh, um, afterward, but, but what I tend to see in my personal experience that I do think was kind of confirmed um, in the, the data that Dan and I collected is that the addict gets a boost in their personal recovery. Um, Absolutely. Um, and it's an ironic experience for the partner because on the one hand, that's what she wanted, that she or he wanted. Okay. Um, but there's also like, like, well, the addict's feeling better and, yeah. and, and I'm in some pain and grief. When I do preparation with the addicts for disclosure, one of the things that we talk about and highlight is, I want you to practice keeping your face neutral because it's not uncommon that addicts, as they're going through disclosure, feel that lightness and that lack of secrets, and they, they start to feel better. And if they break into a beaming smile in the middle of disclosure, it's typically not received well by the partner. And yeah. so there's that piece about, well, let's, let's practice how you present this, even though you might be feeling lighter as you get to the end of it. But maybe I'll put one other piece in mm -hmm. around for those who don't quite get um, how the process might be beneficial. And it's to add that for the, the, the partner who doesn't know, the, the, um, the non-betraying partner who really doesn't know what the exact history is, it's very difficult to figure out how you heal when you don't know what you're healing from. And one of the things I do like about um, um, the AppSatch research that we're involved in is that when you look at, compare the sort of subjective pain from the discovery itself to the, um, the wait time, that sometimes prolonged wait time, or if it's not prolonged, it always feels prolonged and agonizing for for the person waiting to discover what, what's real. Um, and compare that to the subjective pain of the actual formal therapeutic disclosure itself. Um, wait time for the partner is, is much more painful than the actual disclosure. Yeah. Do you remember the exact numbers on the Likert scale, zero to 10? I think I have a rough. I, um, yes. it fluctuates. I'm sort of the person who, who monitors some of the apps that stuff. So it fluctuates, but it's genuinely like the emotional impact of discovery, uh, 9.64, um, the, uh, with 10 being the worst with the 10 stress being you the can worst. imagine okay. at zero being nothing. Uh, the, the, the wait time for the partner, um, is 9.2. Yeah. And the um, the impact, the pain impact from the, the full disclosure is 7.7. 7. Mm -hmm. So the wait time is heavier, harder, yeah. more painful. Yeah. And this is partners making these comments and, and rating the scale. Yeah. So how, can 
can I just ask, so how do the two of you, Dan and Janice, how do you guide then around what's um, too short a time, right? So the partner says, wow, you know, I don't want them to really hurry through this and then it's incomplete, but I don't want to wait a year either. And there are some uh, therapists out there that'll say, oh, you know, the, the addict's not ready. They're not emotionally stable yet. They, they won't be able to do the disclosure. We have to wait. So how do, what do you, what do you say? Well, well, for me, it's important that, you know, a principle in our profession is informed consent. So for me, it's really important that on the partner's end, um, that the partner understands that there are consequences, there are pros and cons, and that disclosure occurs on a continuum, as does recovery. And the earlier, the earlier in the process you do it, here's the, here are the possible benefits and here are the possible consequences. Um, and and so for me, um, I put it I put it to my clients, um, and we have a lot of discussions around that. So can I expand on that, Janice? So for example, for me, it takes roughly six to eight weeks to prepare someone, the betraying party, for the disclosure for a written. And we're talking about there's different types of disclosures, but we're talking about a written document disclosure, sometimes less, rarely more if someone's really taking it seriously, because um, we go through multiple revisions and edits. But I, I like what you said, Janice, because if especially if it's early on, like we can do it, we can do a disclosure really early on. Um, and, and I guess we have to look at what's the goal of it? What's the point? Is it is it to build? Um, is it to get to a new grounding, a foundation of honesty and truth in the relationship? Is it to build empathy and validation for the partner's experience? What are what are we doing this for? And that where we are in the healing recovery process might will dictate kind of what the disclosure is going to look like and what that result might be. So I think that's the informed consent Janice is talking yeah. about. Um, but the idea of a wait time, you know, I, I think of again using cancer. If I was told by a practitioner, you have cancer will tell you in a year what stage it is. I mean, can you imagine what would that be like? Can anyone imagine that? Can wait, wait six months and maybe then you'll be ready to handle what the what stage cancer you've got. There's I mean, a, I, that's cruel in my opinion. Be maddening, but there's this, this balance that, that we try to, to walk here, which is, I sometimes talk about it as for partners, disclosure never comes soon enough. And for addicts, it always comes too soon. And figuring out, you know, when is the addict able to actually do an honest, full disclosure? Because there is that piece to it. And at the same time, when is it just dragging their feet because they don't want to do this? And the partner is being harmed in that process. And there's a, it, 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 there's, there, I, I wish there was like a, a solid answer of you do this, this many days into, you know, recovery, but there's not. It's, what you do you think, what are your guidelines? I, was gonna, I, was gonna say, I really think this comes back to that informed consent, because if a partner is saying, look, I understand that it's not going to be the best quality and I need something sooner than later. Yeah, I, I need something really so that. that I can actually calm down enough. I need something sooner, even if it's less quality, yeah. so that I can calm down enough to know if my children are safe yeah. or um, you know, if I have to worry about new screws showing up at my door, I need, I need something so that now I can begin to focus on myself and my own healing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and sometimes we, I know we talk, I'm sorry, I know that we talk about in, in certainly the two disclosures, like an immediate addressing one or two concerns and then the, the full one. But I, I just want to make sure that we're clear on like, that's an option to say, I'm, I choose I've been educated on pros and cons. I choose, I will request that the addict provides a disclosure sooner than later. And I understand we are going to get what we get based on where that person is in their therapeutic process. I, that's what I need. I want to honor that. And that's well, I, why the, the, it ended up with three volumes for this workbook. I mean, we started with like, okay, what's the procedure for disclosure? And then we thought, you know, well, there's different ways to do this. What happens? So actually volume one became the whole volume is deciding what are the benefits and risks of disclosure? What are the pros, cons, the myths of disclosure, what it is, what it isn't. How do we deal with a polygraph, which we haven't even broached that right. word. 
polygraph or not, when to do that. And also, um, you know, one thing that I, I appreciate Janice helping me think through is content versus behavioral truth. So if, if I'm getting information in a disclosure, that's the content, but also I'm getting information about the behaviors. How, how are, how's the person showing up? What's their maturity level in this? You know, if they're taking it seriously or are they, you know, are they not like there's a maturity level that we can, we can see. And that's information that the partner can get even early on their maturity level or empathy level may be lower. Um, and yes, there will be benefits to waiting longer because the addict will, will hopefully have more maturity. They'll have more understanding of their addiction, the problems, and then also the consequences and impacts it had. But again, we have to weigh that, like, like you said, Tim, we have to weigh that with what's going to be in the best interest of the partner and the relationship. And can this, can this relationship that's so fragile and traumatized, can they hang in there long enough to wait for this? Yeah. I also want to point out that that there's a tendency sometimes to talk and to think of the full disclosure as like the icing on the cake of um, this wonderful sort of recovery that the addict may be in. But I've had because um, I've, I've navigated um, as both partner guide, addict guide, couples guide. And I, there's so many, so many people I can remember who their real dis recovery process really to drop down into it came because of the full disclosure, mm -hmm. you know, um, and, and that, that might be a disappointment to say the partner, mm -hmm. but it, it prompts the process, you know, of the healing that, that we, we, you know, both parties want to begin with. Um, and I've, I've had a lot of people who never got real sobriety until after the full disclosure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, let me ask a uh, softball question. So do you recommend that people pick up your workbooks, work through them on their own and do a disclosure themselves at home, just the two of them? Well, and I just want to, so <laughs> I, I, I'm going to ask it in a different way. <laughs> so, so um, for people that can afford, right, to have two therapists, mm -hmm and um, live in communities where they have access to people who are qualified to do this, that's one thing. What about people who don't, who can't afford therapists, who live in, in a place where they don't have access to this kind of therapy? You are so you know, much so nicer than I am. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you said it. <laughs> well, good point, Wendy, good point. Yeah, could, is there a way, you know, so, um optimally it would i'm thinking it's it's great if you've got that therapeutic piece but if you don't then what so i'll um dan maybe i'll take one piece of that and then sure. you can take the leftover <laughs> <laughs> um so here's a piece that i that love might, this here's a piece that might be controversial at least in the um, the csat sort of um the professional community who specializes in, in um, in dealing with betrayal, um, because I, I, I know there's a lot of talk about that there should be two therapists, you know, one for each party. Um, and um, I don't always have the luxury, you know, that I, I, I do, I do in, intensives. And so full disclosure intensives, I don't, I've been for many years, I didn't have anybody else with me. Uh, there wasn't, there weren't a lot of disclosures going on in Texas um, in, in those days. We're talking like five to 10 years ago. So I, I had to start that process. And what I have found, this is just sort of Janice's, you know, um, pulling it out of my, my fanny um, statistics. I have found that seven out of 10 times, it's, it's, it's easily and in some ways less frustrating to do to have one person guiding it. And, and that's just because, you know, then you're, you're like uh, uh, trying to coordinate logistics between two therapists or two professionals um, with busy schedules or two professionals who have very different ways that they coordinate the full disclosure. Um, that's part of what we also tried to build into the workbooks is a way that um, all people, including the, the professionals are on the same page using the same language. Mm -hmm. um, there, but I will, I will, there are about three out of 10 times that I, when I'm, I'm guiding it as a couples therapist, I'm thinking this really would have worked better, you know, 
with with another therapist but um you know the that's something, Wendy, that that I've also done a lot of thinking about because before I was in private practice, I worked with Medicaid, Medicare clients, or like low. That was that was the majority of my career was low income, mm -hmm. and um, while we certainly didn't want, if 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 it's unnecessary for people to try to do this on their own, we did want to create a process where um, they could do some prep independent and perhaps find um, a guide who's an intern specializing but an intern at lower cost or um, you know there are other types of professionals that are sort of stepping into the ring for navigating full disclosures there are some of it's coming out of the faith community and um, while I would prefer that everybody has a very well-trained guide I'd also like for those who are in that that place where they really have to think of alternatives, to also have to have some resources as well as well, and for some of those professionals um, who who don't have the training that we do, um, to have something in addition because it's happening anyway. I appreciate that, Janice, just because um, sometimes I think with sex addiction, betrayal trauma, we are thinking mainly of um, the United States. And um, I'm finding that throughout the world, yeah. um, there is more and more um, evidence and people seeking help with yeah. pornography addiction, sex addiction, betrayal trauma. So um you know for those people in other countries this could be such a valuable resource for uh, professionals that d don't wouldn't even be able to know how to guide them through it yeah and now, i'll just put in a plug that there are an awful lot of those people who are in our country too the okay. usa still has an awful lot of people and the poverty line is 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 getting closer and closer to lots of folks but especially post covid mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just say I thank you everything you said, Janice. Too, I, I echo, and I think the question is important because unfortunately, to this point, it's been you know private pay clients who have resources that can afford this kind of stuff. And while we might recommend having you know two therapists in the room, I think there are other options to do this. We do recommend that this be guided by a professional, but but one of our big reasons was to streamline the cost and the time yes. that you don't have to reinvent the wheel. If you work through some of this, you can you can save yourself a lot of time and and money by working through some of it and then having a guide, you know, help you through it. That's one reason we we wanted to do this so that you could buy a workbook instead of having to spend, you know, a professional's hourly rate to work through all this stuff with. So yeah. I do think there's different ways to do it. I'm actually really excited about coaches that may be able in you know parts of the country or the world where there, you know, like, uh, therapists have license restrictions. There's coaches that, that can have access. Um, and we're seeing, I think we don't have great data on it yet, but remote disclosures are happening and they're working for the most part. So yeah. never would have thought that would be a, a thing, but it it's becoming that. So I just think there are more options. And I think, you know, I've even served as like a consultant for a guide and, you know, maybe the, the rate is, is lower. I'll take a look at someone's document and give my feedback. And that's going to be way cheaper than having, you know, a professional mm -hmm. work the whole time with someone. So there's okay. different options. And I think that that can streamline the cost and that, that can make it more accessible, but it's a really good point. Cause right now, you know, typically it's been people with resources that could afford to do this work. I want to put, put out the piece of, um, that there's a training coming mm -hmm. in 2023 that Janice and Dan are creating that Absats is sponsoring, uh, specifically mm -hmm. training professionals of how to do this. It's not for the clients, but it is for the professionals an intensive training on how to do quality disclosures. So mm -hmm. that's a resources that's coming out next year. Awesome. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I'd like to also point, because I this is going to sound really make me sound very morbid, but I love disclosures. I'm with you <laughs> because they're they're a microcosm of like the whole healing process, um, and and part of the, the the reason it took longer I think than we thought it was going to take as well is that 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 there's a there's a um, a lot of evidence out there now in terms of the partner experiencing trauma, um, and um, so so with that the process we're looking at at contributing to 
trauma healing. Mm -hmm. um, and so the, I think partners initially think that they're sort of the passive, uh, passively waiting for the addict to uh, create the document and share the truth and that that's their only role. But very few people I know if uh, in Galveston, I'm in, I'm in Texas, so I've got some, some Houston and Galveston folk, when they hear a hurricane's coming um, and maybe make their decision whether they're gonna like hightail it out or try to stay stand their ground. Those who stand their ground, they don't just sit around, you know, waiting. They start preparing for that. Mm -hmm. And they're preparing because they want to come through it in, in the best shape that they can come through it. Um, you know, and once they get the sort of the emergency supplies, then they go for comfort. Okay, we, we can make it through the storm, but we might be out of power for three to four weeks. So then they start attending to comfort, to come through it with greater comfort. Um, the same way the Red Cross might show up with, with comfort items. And so there's a, there's a part of that that's really, I think is really important for the partner. Um, and what I see is when they do prepare in that way, then there's a little, little tiny bit less patience with the time it takes um, for the addict to write the document, but they do come through better. And, and everything that they gain in the preparation, that doesn't, it's not thrown away just because the disclosure is over. They, they use all of that um, for, their, for the recovery process that comes afterward. So, um, and uh, even though they can't see that um, while they're in the prep, I can and professionals can. Mm -hmm. um, and I would also say just in the preparation for, for the addict, um, Dan, I haven't told you this, this is something I felt really good about. The last two or three times I've been, somebody's reached out to me to participate in that process of helping get the document done. And I'm, I'm always giving, you know, quibbling and being, you know, equivocating on how long it's gonna take because I never know what shape the document's in when we start. Um, the last three have actually used uh, the Addicts Workbook, Dan. And when I first meet them, I'm gonna look it over. It's like, oh, okay. Yeah, this isn't really gonna take that long to kind of get this in final shape. So it really cuts down what, what before might've been weeks and weeks and weeks. Mm -hmm. of preparation and makes the process, I think, a lot kinder and gentler. That's fantastic. In the partner's workbook, is some of that, is some or all of that prep in that workbook? That's in, yeah, that's in volume two. Um, so I'm a somatic experiencing practitioner, um, have been so for oh, 12 something or other years, don't want to do the math. Um, and all of the, we wrote it from the perspective of the, the person, you know, doing the workbook, the partner. So it's not big technical kinds of language, but for, for professionals out there, the entire underpinning of that volume, um, is a polyvagal informed preparation for the full disclosure process. That's I want to highlight, we've talked a lot about the preparation. Mm -hmm. And I think we're all on the same page of the importance yes. of the preparation. But one of the things I'm realizing that we haven't spoken really about is expectations or, or thoughts about how it's going to go after the disclosure. Okay, so you've done all this preparation work and document and questions and answers and maybe polygraph, which we haven't gotten to, which I'm thinking maybe is disclosure talk part two. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, managing expectations of what's it like after those disclosure sessions. Yeah. Uh, so, it's, so it's interesting, Dan. I don't know if you remember how some of those exercises in, in the, the, the part three evolved, because I just happened to be doing a ton of disclosures that year. Um, and it would be, okay, Dan, Dan, I'd, I'd call him up, Dan, you've got to write, write something. I've got somebody with, um, you know, just devastated because of you know in, uh, inappropriate expectations on the back end. I think that's how it's going to get worse before it gets better. Mm -hmm. Like evolved, we really sort of followed all of our people, seeing what do they need um, after the disclosure, um, and we're we're sort of writing you, you know um, both information and creating exercises to help them through afterward. 
Yeah, there, there, there's literally an exercise. Um, you know, it's 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 going to get worse before it gets better. And 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 we have to. I realized the hard way. You know, we focus so much, like you said, Jeannie, on preparing for disclosure, getting through it. That sometimes, at least for me, I didn't focus so much on okay, now now what? Because sometimes on the addict side, it's a huge undertaking. You know, okay, finally, you, I I'm committed to doing it. I see the value. I'm going to do it, and I did it. All right, I'm done. We're good. Now we can go back to life as normal. Which that's of one course, side of the equation. that's one side and they feel relieved. Like Tim said, they feel unburdened. They feel like, finally, I have no secrets anymore. Like how freeing that is. And yet I'm scared. I don't know what my partner's going to do with this information, but we have to realize that now this unburdening of secrets, now the partner has to sit with all that pain and trauma and, and heal from that. And there's a huge, that's the beginning point of the healing, not the end point. So, okay. so yeah, we did a lot of stuff to prepare for that. And then shifting on, at least on the addict side, shifting, okay, disclosure is about me sharing my narrative. Now my job is to focus on, okay, this is my story. What's my partner's story now? So yeah. focusing on how do I get to more of the empathy journey after of, all right, now that I see that the impact on my, my partner, um, like I'm, I'm looking back through my timeline and I'm saying, okay, well, this, I was acting out in, in my partner's at this significant period in my partner's relationship, you know, while pregnant or during a, a difficult time and I was completely absent. So that helps prepare them for the impact or restitution or whatever we call it, you know, or even the amends afterwards. So I think there's a lot of, of focus that we, we need to do afterwards for sure yeah. and clarification of the expectation like you said because the addict tends to feel unburdened and and that's part of the preparation i think to the partner yeah it's like the addict tends to feel unburdened and the partner tends to feel weighted it's like the dump truck pulled up lo unload the the load on the partner's mm -hmm. side of the fence and on the partner's yard and now the partner has is looking at this going how do i make sense of this yeah. and so the patience that's needed for the partner to have whatever experience the partner needs to be able to go through that and figure it out in a different way. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. It's a little bit like, I think for the partner, I call it the big grief. Like now that I kind of think I know it all. And if I've had a polygraph, maybe I have, I, I, I think a little bit more strongly that I have it all. Um, now that the really deep grieving begins, at the same time that she's also like trying to put it all together to understand his story so she can then toggle from his story to oh this is my story mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i'll just say one more thing on that the the on the addict side you know that the the two if we go back to their core beliefs says you know if if uh, if i share all this stuff there's no way I'll be rejected, abandoned. There's no way my partner would stay after after hearing this. So they there's this usual fear and terror that they have of like knowing what's the answer. Are you staying or are you going? And I just have to say, it's so much more complicated than that. I'm, I've literally had uh, an addict say, okay, you've got two weeks to decide what you're going to do because <laughs> of their own anxiety. Yeah. Well, that's not fair. That's not fair to put on anybody, obviously. So we can't, we can't, so we have to worry or uh, focus on, okay, how do you manage your own anxiety about now, now your partner's got this information and we, now we have a lot of relational healing to do and safety rebuilding and trust rebuilding. And then, you know, let alone intimacy rebuilding. I just want to remind people that you're listening to conversations on sex addiction and relationships. And today we've got uh, Janice Cuddle and Dan Drake with us today that are talking about disclosure. Thank you. So, so Janice, tell me a little bit about what it's like working through this process, because this can be daunting and heavy and scary for the partner and the addict. So, yeah. Well, and I'm imagining that the partner and the addict may be listening, probably feels a bit daunted and scared right now. Um, but I'll go, I go back to that analogy that Dan used of the medical analogy, the sort of the cancer. Um, if, you, if you can't get to the root of it, you know, um, and, and, and clean that out, then there really can't be healing in the long run, uh, things will get worse. So even though there's a rawness, now you're finally really dealing with truth and truth can be painful. But from that place of truth is, is the start of the rebuild. And part of the reason that I also love the disclosure process 
is for the couples that do it. And God, I think people would be surprised how many couples do do it. Like I'm not, I went through this, I'm not gonna do it, do it half done. There's such a depth to their relationship. It's kind of like if we, there's a confidence that gets built. Once we've done it, if we could get through this, there's really not a lot left that we can't. Um, and you have to like really learn a lot of skills to do it. So, um, and, and in that for, for both, for the couple, there's a thing called post-traumatic growth. And the criteria is something super crummy happened kind of shattered things, broke you apart, you have no real idea on earth how to, you know, how to put it back together. Um, and somewhere along the way, you give up on putting it back together as it was. And you put it together as it now can be. And it becomes very precious and, and cherished. And so you really protect it. Um, and uh, you have to, I'm, I'm actually a family psychologist. So I was sort of my base training is in working with couples. And I never saw couples working to this depth until I came into this specialty. So it feels really sacred to me. What a great way to end this conversation. Thank you, Dan and Janice, because ending on post-traumatic growth and yeah. marriage relationship 2.0, I mean, I feel like we just went through the whole process. That was lovely. Thank you, Janice. Well, what a great conversation. So glad that you, uh, Dan and Janice, are here to, to talk about your books and, and the importance of disclosure. And uh, I really liked sort of the, how you were talking about the variety of ways to go about disclosure and how beneficial it can be. Um, again, the books um, are, I, I can't read them from here, Full Disclosure, Seeking Truth After Sexual Betrayal, or full disclosure okay, when how to you... share the truth after sexual betrayal <laughs> thank you green both and blue women. green is for green partners blue. blue is for addicts both of which written by the brilliant janice cottle and dan drake and available on amazon.com and uh again thank you so much for listening to this conversation hope you found it helpful hope you'll join us for future conversations and if you haven't already please rate us wherever you found us which I assume is Spotify or Stitcher or YouTube or one of those many places that uh, our podcast ends up. And uh, again, thank you for joining this conversation and we hope to see you again in the future.